Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I should perhaps say that I'm not necessarily an expert about vultures, but I do really, really like them, and I know something about them. And uh, it's actually really nice to hear that. I mean, that's the first time I've heard that um, on the uh, on your recording. Uh, it's so actually nice not to hear completely negative things. Um, before we kind of start, do any of you would any of you say that you're like a, a vulture lover already? You like vultures or maybe a little bit okay fantastic anybody think well i've not ever really thought about that question before and therefore i'm not really sure yeah okay that's absolutely fine um what we tend to find is that vultures get a a really bad reputation and a big part of my job which i'll tell you a little bit about during this uh, presentation is to try and turn the tide on that really and tell as many people as possible about them and uh, to try and turn as many people into a vulture lover as possible thank you very much thanks um, so my name's Tom, I work for an organisation called the, the Hawk Conservancy Trust and uh, Abby and I first met when she came on an experience at uh, uh, another bird of prey collection that I worked at in Northamptonshire and uh, a big part of the days that we run as much as possible is to get people to interact with a vulture and the reason we try to get people to interact with a vulture and fall in love with them is because they are the most endangered group of birds on earth. So there are 23 species of vultures across the world. Over half of those are either threatened, endangered, or critically endangered. And on the very worst scale of that, it means that within the next 50 years, we could see them completely extinct in the wild. Uh, and that doesn't sound like necessarily a bad thing, especially if you think, well, they're kind of a bit ugly and we don't really like them anyway, until you realize the kind of positive role that they play and, and the ecosystems they live in um, in the wild. Um, so this is me, this is what I spend about 50% of my time doing at the Hawk Conservancy Trust is training and working with uh, critically endangered vultures. Uh, it's a great, great fun. This is a bird uh, who goes by the name of Clay and uh, he is a four or five year old uh, African white bat vulture. And he has a wingspan of about seven feet from tip to tip and across his shoulders uh, and he can eat about 50% of his own body weight in about 10 minutes. So he's an incredible bird in so many different ways um, but not least because he's actually a really kind, nice and gentle soul which people don't necessarily uh, expect from, uh, from a vulture. Uh, I work with birds of prey for most of my life really. I first, uh, first and foremost started off doing what um, Abby and her family came to do, which was to have an experience. Have any of you ever had a chance to fly a bird of prey before to the end of your arm? No, you have? Brilliant. Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, well, hopefully you'll know that it's quite a special experience and um, a little bit like we were doing with the uh, natural objects with um, Stella Liron. It's a way of kind of connecting with with wildlife and nature by having a, essentially a wild animal be, in, be comfortable in close proximity to us as human beings. And through that, the hope is that we send people away with a, a positive, uh, positive view of the natural world and think about things a little bit more. And that's certainly what happened to me. I went out then into the natural world and saw birds of prey everywhere, tried to uh, spend as much time out and about in the countryside, mostly with my grandparents. Uh, and we'd go and spot a buzzard or we'd see a kestrel or some wild birds of prey. Um, and, and my passion for that grew. And I was lucky enough that when I left school, I was able to do that as a, as a profession. So I could train birds of prey, work with members of the public, uh, work with schools to try and, uh, try and enlighten as many people as possible about them. Um, so this is where I work now, which is uh, it's in Hampshire, um, quite close to Andover in Hampshire. Um, it's a collection that's been around for the last 50 years. And uh, we house a team of uh, about 150 birds, really, uh, most of which take part in our daily flying demonstrations. So people can come and see the birds doing uh, what they would do naturally. We try and keep the, the displays as natural, really, as we possibly can, meaning not asking them to do things that they wouldn't naturally be doing in the wild. And obviously giving those op opportunity for people seeing what they would be doing in the wild. Um, we... Well, it's kind of changed a lot over the years from basically just being a field with some birds flown around. Now we have about 60,000 visitors come to visit us each year. And it's through the visitor centre that we're able to fund the work that we do in terms of conservation. So that's both in the UK with birds of prey and overseas, uh, specifically at this time with, with vultures, which is what we've uh, come to talk about today. Um, now I have to say, we fly all sorts of different birds from owls to hawks, eagles, falcons, kites, and of course vultures. And the birds tend to make an entrance out into one of the arenas that we fly the birds in. If it's an owl, 
everybody in that arena, whether they do it vocally or not, but everybody will go, oh, because they're kind of cute, aren't they? And they're kind of within our society, they're kind of on uh, scatter cushions and they're on T-shirts, on jewellery. We have this real love of owls. Um, and weirdly, that hasn't always been the case. Lots of owls have been demonized over time. People thought they were like uh, messengers of death and all sorts and did horrible things to owls over time. But these days, luckily, um, safe to say that pretty much everybody I speak to um, has positive feelings about owls. Uh, and then we fly something like a falcon who might fly over 200 miles an hour towards us and it's a really special uh, experience. Everybody goes, wow, when they see that bird because it's exciting and you hear people do that. Bless him, when clay comes out, I've genuinely heard people just go, ugh, look at that horrible bird because he's kind of ugly and ungainly and he's got this long snake-like neck and um, he's kind of got that classic jungle book vulture look, hasn't he? And uh, he kind of has this strange gait as he kind of waddles around the place. And it's going from that er uh, to that wow and ah uh, that we want to try and do throughout, throughout our displays. And the best way to do that is, is to fly vultures for people, really. Now, generally, the view that people have of uh, vultures it's a little bit like this. This is a group of vultures uh, that's come down to an impala carcass. Um, this was taken uh, in South Africa. We've got um, two white bat vultures, just like clay on either side, uh, and two lappet face vultures. Um, they are not blessed with the, the best beautiful physical features, the lappet face vulture. I've heard them described as the Phil Mitchell of the bird world. Uh, they are absolutely huge. They're hench. They want to have a fight with anybody, and uh, that's how they survive because this is entirely natural behavior for the vultures. They come down on a carcass, they feed as quickly as they possibly can, and they don't let anybody else get in the way. So they kind of push uh, other animals out of the way. Um, and that's absolutely fine because that actually helps the other vultures that are around them. If you have a look at the size of the beak of the lappet face vulture, it's absolutely massive. Uh, it's like a pair of bolt cutters to tear into the hide of a carcass. And that allows some of the smaller vultures to come in and start to feed. So although they're very aggressive, they're very dominant around the carcass, they're actually a really positive force for the ecosystem around them. They can all come in to feed. Um, or maybe um, slightly more gruesomely, this one. I've come down to a ill-fated lion. Again, this is a um, this is a white bat vulture here coming in to have some lunch. And it's this kind of image of the birds kind of covered in blood and guts and horrible stuff that tends to be another reason for turning people off. Um, people think that sadly because they eat dead things that they are in some way uh, lesser beings than some of the other birds. People uh, will praise things like falcons and hawks for catching their own tea and they have this amazing, uh, uh, amazing view of them. But actually the vultures, they are the cleanup crew of the wild really and without them we already know in some societies that disease is on the increase because of a because of a lack of vultures. Um, this is an incredible video um, that uh, that we use quite a lot to display just how important and vital vultures can be um, for their ecosystem. So this is uh, a group of around fifty white bat vultures again coming in to feed on an impala carcass. Um, and this is showing us in real time how long it's taking them to, to feed. As I say, it's a little bit, bit gruesome, but it gives an opportunity to realize why we think vultures are important. In fact, we're learning more and more why, uh, why they're important. It's because of their ability to do this. Now, that impala weighs about 50 kilos. And uh, in 50, uh, with 50 white bat vultures coming to feed, so 50 white bat vultures eating a 50 kilo carcass, removes that potential for harboring disease in 10 minutes. It's an incredible amount of food disappearing very, very quickly. And in areas where we're seeing vultures on uh, the decline, those bodies start to build up. And uh, this was shown on a BBC documentary about uh, five years ago now, um, discussing why vultures are important. And particularly with the great wildebeest migration each year, lots of those wildebeest don't make it. And they tend to drown quite often crossing uh, some of the hardest rivers and uh, and they end up washing downstream and there's no vultures to eat them and suddenly you get a build-up um, of disease uh, potentially uh, potentially transferring to other other animals um, so instead this is kind of the view that we try to give um, visitors who come to to see us and in fact exactly this view because we try to get people as close to vultures as possible um, and uh, this is a member of the hooded vulture team. It's one of the smallest species of vultures in uh, Africa, weighs no more than uh, a couple of bags of sugar, about four pounds in weight. And they stand 
about that tall. They're really, really, uh, they're sweet natured. Uh, this bird's name is Fagin. And he's so called because he's very good at stealing food out of the bird of prey team uh, pockets. So he's kind of a, a pickpocket by name and by nature. Um, but have a look at his face. And this is one of my favorite things about a vulture. And if there's anybody, uh, by the time we finish flying them, uh, that, uh, that still doesn't feel like we're, they, they've fallen in love with a vulture, it's this. Um, very, very pink face, as you can see. And that's kind of entirely natural. Um, but when they're kind of in the aviary or even in the wild, when they're kind of sat up in the tree and they're roosting, there's not a lot going on. Their faces are actually completely pale. Um, they're a similar color to their legs and their feet, which are like a pale grayish color. When they come out and they're flying and they're feeding, they're getting excited. This is a bird that literally blushes with excitement. And if that isn't really cute, I don't know what is. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And they do this to communicate with each other. They actually haven't got very much by way of a, a voice box. Uh, they don't c communicate very much by sound. So instead they do it by color. And this is Fagin saying to the other vultures around him, this is really good, you guys. Come down here. It's entirely safe. We're having a wonderful time and there's loads of food to eat. So they blush with excitement, um, which I think is, is wonderful. And so this is uh, giving an idea of the sort of space where the birds are, are flying. We theme uh, each of the areas really to try and show the birds off in as, as best way as we possibly can. And uh, so we fly our hooded vultures in our African savanna and they come down to a, a buffalo carcass that has frankly seen better days and they come down and feed in so that natural way. And this is kind of what it's all about. There's kind of a, a three uh, prong part to our um, to our work really at the Trust. One is to try and be a visitor attraction. So we have to do all the things that people expect at a zoological establishment. We have a restaurant, we have a shop, and we try and look after people when they come for a day with us. We want people to go away with a positive view of the birds. And to do that, we have to make sure we're looking after them. The other two sides of it are kind of the important side, really, the bit that we do everything else for. Um, and one is conservation out in the wild, and I'll come to that in a, a few minutes time. Uh, but the other is captive breeding birds, because where we have massively declining populations in the wild, totally unsustainable levels of uh, birds falling in numbers, um, then we have to start thinking about uh, creating a bit of an arc for those uh, animals in captivity. And whether that be pandas or snow leopards or vultures, it is an imperative part of, of trying to save a species is to try and rescue them in, in, in captivity. Um, so we're very lucky. We have a member on our team who holds something called an EEP, European Endangered Species Programme. It's essentially like a, like a dating app for uh, endangered animals, really. It's trying to get the right match uh, in terms of uh, bloodlines and characteristics, size and shape between uh, the different birds. And this is uh, part of the success of doing that well. And one of my colleagues, uh, Jane Robertson, uh, she holds the EEP and it's her job to make sure that all of those matches go well. Um, so this was one of the babies from, uh, from a few years ago. Uh, his name is Cassius and he's still a member of our flying team at the Trust. But many of our birds that are bred at the Trust, they go off uh, to have lives elsewhere across the world uh, to become a further part of that um, breeding population in, in captivity. The eventual aim of all breeding in captivity for any zoological establishment is, of course, to re-release those birds back out into the wild. The reason we're not doing that at the moment is because, in fact, the wild isn't very safe for them to live in. And so we have to fix the problem in the wild first, because releasing a bird like this is, uh, well, could potentially be a, a death sentence to that individual. Um, and because they only have one chick every year, they are incredibly precious. Um, and, uh, and so we can't, can't afford to be releasing them uh, in areas that are not safe. Um, possibly the most beautiful species of vulture to me is this one. Um, this is a, a white-headed vulture. This bird's name is Angus. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Satara, are the most successful pair of their species in captivity in terms of breeding anywhere in the world. And this year we welcomed their fourth chick. Uh, to the trust uh, as yet unnamed because he's not done anything with us yet she's um, still being looked after by mum and dad in in the aviary um, but uh, this is a critically endangered species in the wild and we're still learning um, how to how to um, protect these birds out in the wild um, and this I don't know whether I can click a video can I click a video do you want to see if you can get that to play I just wanted to show you something oh there we go Oh, it doesn't want to play. Oh, that's all right. 
I just wanted to show you Angus and Satara with their baby from last year, because kind of another thing we try and tell people is how wonderful they are as parents. As I said, they only have that one chick every year, which obviously, you know, they need to put all of their eggs into one basket. That's right. Go away. Um, and so they're, they're, they are so, so attentive um, for a really short time in the year. So they'll have their egg. Egg takes about uh, 40 days to incubate, to hatch. And uh, then they'll spend the next 10 weeks completely doting on that bird. Um, incredibly, each of these birds, they're, they're huge, by the way. They have about a, just a bit bigger than clay, about seven and a half foot wingspan. And uh, they weigh in at about 12 pounds in weight at their biggest. So they're absolutely massive. And yet they'll go from an egg about that big uh, to a fully grown white headed vulture in about 10 weeks. So that's partly why mum and dad have to be so good because they need to find loads of food to keep that growth rate going. So vultures across the world, as I say, over half of them, uh, half of the species are either threatened, endangered or critically endangered. Uh, those in the States have uh, their own issues, largely down to uh, poisoning or eating things like lead shot has been a, a massive issue. And also just general persecution. Um, the Andean condor, the Californian condor most famously uh, now is slowly, slowly recovering in terms of their numbers. Um, so we, uh, as an organization, we focus on Asian vultures and African vultures. And what became known as the uh, Asian vulture crisis um, uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, we've seen a 99% percent decline uh, in uh, Asian vultures, uh, owing largely to a, a drug called diclofenac. It's an anti-inflammatory ingredient that was given to cattle to treat lameness. And uh, if you've ever taken Voltarol for any aches and pains, it's the active ingredient in Voltarol. Uh, unfortunately, it is poisonous to vultures, and we think probably poisonous to other species of raptors as well. Um, and uh, it's now been banned in most parts of Asia where we saw the biggest declines. Uh, it is currently in the process to continue being licensed to be used uh, with, within Europe. And we have over half of the world's population of vultures in Europe and something that we know caused a massive decline and almost extinction of species in Asia is still on the cards to be used in Europe. So that's kind of a, another point that we're targeting that to try and potentially limit the, the damage of that. But we did two things to try and halt the, the population decline in Asia. One was to develop a vulture safe zone. Uh, and we create things called vulture restaurants, which sounds like a quirky name, but it's a genuine thing. It's a safe place for vultures to come down and feed and we'll supplementary feed them with, with safe food. So that if they are going off and feeding on other things, they've got a choice really. They can come in and feed somewhere that, that is kind of protected. Uh, and the other thing, just like uh, at, at the Trust, we develop a captive breeding program uh, with these birds, which are called Asian white bat vultures, very similar to clay, uh, kind of their Asian cousins, if you like. Uh, and as you can see, over the last uh, few years, we have had uh, success. We did actually have another chick this year in 2019. And other projects that are very similar have begun to start reintroducing those birds now that diclofenac is being used less and less within those environments. So uh, positive news, really. Unfortunately, the biggest focus on our um, well, really on our sites at the moment is the work that we do uh, in Africa. Um, the issue in Africa is predominantly poisoning incidents. And I'm sure you've all heard of the ivory trade. It's kind of like the big bad wolf of wildlife crime uh, where people will uh, slaughter elephants in order to try and uh, get their tusks. Um, and in part, vultures are very, very key to fighting that trade because where an elephant has been shot, vultures will start to do what they do best and they will circle overhead and very often in, in large numbers. And if you're a game guard trying to search many hundreds and hundreds of square miles to try and find a poacher and catch them in the act, having kind of those sentinels in the sky flying around is a really good indication of where you might find uh, uh, some, somebody doing something untoward. And so they follow groups of vultures around. They use them as help in the sky to try and find what's happening down below. Unfortunately, the poachers have realized this. And so what they've begun to do is lace the carcasses that they shoot with poison and uh, lace the area around the carcass with poison meat. That's poison so potent it will kill vultures with food still in their mouths. Um, so it's an incredible, um, in incredibly detrimental thing to local populations. Now, fairly recently, back in uh, earlier this year in the summer, we had one incident uh, in a national park in Botswana, uh, where uh, three elephant carcasses have been poisoned and over 600 vultures came down to feed on that, those three carcasses and over 600 vultures 
lost their lives. And with an endangered species, we know that things like the white-headed vulture, those beautiful birds, all those colours critically endangered in the wild, they've become locally extinct in some parts of Africa now, be purely because of those poisoning incidents. And so uh, we started something called our Poison Response Action Campaign, uh, training uh, game guards uh, across Africa, but mostly uh, in South Africa and parts of Kimberley, uh, to deploy the use of these, which is a poison response kit. Nothing particularly uh, special about it. It's got some fairly basic tools in there, uh, including a notepad to take notes. It's got a, a camera in there to try and collect evidence. Uh, and it has got one or two items of medication as well to try and flush a vulture system through. Sadly, 99% of the time, once a vulture is fed on the poison meat, it is kind of too late at that point and nothing really can be done for those birds. But what it's about is securing that carcass and removing it from the environment as quickly as possible. Because it isn't just the vultures that get affected by that poisoning, it's other species as well, um, including some uh, endangered mammals as well, like hunt painted hunting dogs. Um, you can kind of see the effect that that work is having. Um, the orange line gives you an idea of how quickly we could expect a complete eradication of vultures um, over the next 50 to 80 years. Um, it's still a downtrend even with the work that we're doing at the moment. Uh, but this is what most conservation is like, sadly. It's about trying to limit damage. It's about trying to keep populations alive long enough in the hope that we can solve the main problem. And of course, the main problem for vultures in Africa is the ivory trade and that is something that a small establishment and a small conservation organization like ourselves cannot do on our own. That's going to be something that is up at, at government level uh, to try and halt the uh, the want for, for ivory for medicinal purposes for making piano keys. It seems pretty pretty ridiculous doesn't it? But uh, there we go, it gives you an idea. So I was lucky enough um, last year to head to Africa to be a part of this work uh, and we were working in uh, National Park in Kimberley, uh, in Makala National Park, uh, as well as Drumfield National Park, uh, doing, well, essentially processing as many of the young birds as we could to try and track what their success or failure might be, where they were found, where they were picked up, how far these birds travel. Uh, and so we put wing tags on the birds. We would uh, take samples from the bird to try and find out if we had more males, more females in certain areas to try and really get to know the group of birds that were in those areas. Um, and this bird here, this is bird T369. Um, that was the first bird that I climbed up into the top of a very spiny acacia tree and brought down a little plastic bucket ready to be processed for, uh, for everybody to see. Now, I've always hoped that I would hear of a sighting of T369 since then, and nothing has been heard, but I'm kind of sobering the fact that that actually might be a positive thing because largely these vultures only get picked up in terms of their wing tag numbers uh, when they are keeled over on a carcass having been poisoned. So we don't know where T369 is, but we know that they haven't been found uh, having been eaten or having been poisoned by um, human beings. But I think they're really cute, aren't they? Absolutely gorgeous. Um, so we're trying to really understand the populations in the wild and one of those things that we've worked out is that unlike with a lot of mammal species where we could make a massive fence around maybe a national park and hem them in, these vultures travel such huge distances that they are countrywide. They'll travel up and down the continent of Africa throughout a year with no problem at all and so uh, we have to work right across countries, across governments to try and uh, protect these birds as much as possible. And having come back, um, I uh, did a few uh, talks to people uh, about uh, how these birds could be saved and how they could be protected. And one of the main reasons is to turn the tide on how they're viewed. People thinking that they're horrible, disgusting and ugly is, uh, is not the right way about it. And uh, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier on, um, but this is a quote that I first heard when I first went on that flying experience day all that time ago. It sums up everything I think about why we need to spread a little bit of love for vultures because they eat huge amounts of stuff that other parts of the ecosystem can't eat and if they do it spreads a disease to the rest of them and uh, and they're just wonderful animals in their own right and have every right to the amount of attention we give something like a, a panda or a snow leopard and just because they're not as pretty doesn't mean they're nowhere they're nowhere near as important um, so thank you for listening to me and hopefully we've got a few more vulture lovers in the room but thank you, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.